Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Um, I'm Ria Cohn. I'm the Conservation Coordinator here at the Swanner Preserve and Eco Center. And tonight's talk is part of Swanner's Walks, Talks, and Workshops program, a series designed to help engage everyone in nature and the world around us. And an important part of engaging in nature here on the preserve is also recognizing that Swanner Preserve and Eco Center resides on the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Northwestern Band of the Shoshone and the Ute Indian tribe. In offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty, history, and experiences. And before I introduce our presenter, I also want to thank Summit County Rap Tax for supporting our walks, talks, and workshop series. And now it's time to meet our presenter. So Marshall Wolf's a PhD candidate in USU's Watershed Sciences Department, who studies beaver-mediated changes to ecosystems and how well beaver mimicry project like BDAs, beaver dam analogs, are emulating the real deal of natural beaver dams. And his research interests are aquatic and riparian ecology with a focus on stream restoration. Uh, and we've been working with Marshall for the past three years studying these changes on the preserve and are really excited to have him back tonight to uh, talk about his project and final findings. So with that, I will pass it off to Marshall to uh, tell us all about it. Awesome, thank you for the introduction, Rhea. Let's get this going. And get one of these going. Okay, so once again, thanks for the intro, Rhea. Um, just kind of before we get started, I wanted to go ahead and thank the funders who have made this all possible, uh, namely Swanner Preserve, the Sage Land Collaborative, the Utah Department of Environmental Quality, my institution, Utah State University, Department of Watershed Science, and the Ecology Center. So, um, just get this little thing out of the way. There we go. Okay, so a damn good job. Three years of BDA restoration at Swanner Preserve. Let's get started, folks. So uh, before we jump in, I just wanted to provide a purpose of this talk. Um, generally, we want to provide some context for the BDA project at Swanner, explain a, bit, a little bit about our restoration design plan and our monitoring, share some results of the monitoring and research, and then provide some insights from our three going on four years of work at the preserve and the surrounding properties. In order to do that, I kind of created a little outline to organize the flow of the talk and kind of my general thoughts. We'll start off talking about restoration of East Canyon Creek in particular, and kind of set the stage for restoration and the like. Um, then we'll move in on and talk about beaver, and beaver, beaver dam analogs at Swanner. Uh, we'll dive into the meat of the talk, which is kind of some results so far from our restoration. And then I'll conclude by kind of taking some lessons that we've learned and talk about um, different stages as we move forward. So just to kind of set some background, the history of East Canyon Creek is important before we kind of get started talking about restoration. So East Canyon Creek um, was likely trapped by mountain men um, circa 1820, 1830s. This is unrecorded, but the reason I say it's likely is because we have um, some Rocky Mountain rendezvous, which are actual gathering of mountain men where they traded their pelts for money from their companies. Um, so some of the early ones in Cove and Cache Valley, Sweet Lake, Bear Lake, um, Ham's Fork and Burnt Fork all occurred in fairly close proximity to um, Snyderville Basin and Swanner Preserve. So it's likely that there was trapping going on. By the mid 1840s, there was agricultural activity in Snyderville Basin with the first homesteading. And then in 1853, uh, the creation of Snyder's Mill on White Pine, Red Pine and Willow Creeks kind of cemented um, the activity of agricultural and industrial nature in the area. All these three things combined kind of started the process of changing the stream system. Um, just to give you a little overview of the watershed itself, we have Swanner Preserve here in purple at the headwaters of the watershed with Park City, um, Salt Lake, and then I-80 running through the middle. The terminus of the watershed is at the confluence with the Weber, Weber River near Morgan. Um, 
generally East Canyon Creek is a high elevation tributary. Most of the water in the stream is derived from snowfall or some monsoonal rain inputs that bolster August and September flows, but that varies from year to year. And then um, interesting of note is that the, the creek kind of alters between these wide valleys like we have up here at Swanner and then narrow valley segments, wider valley segments, narrow valley segments, wider valley segments. So most of the research that I'll be talking about in this talk actually occurred um, up here in this purple outline that is Swanner. Just to give you a little more information on the hydrograph, um, it's kind of something we'll be talking about a little later in the talk. We generally have base flows in East Canyon Creek pretty much from October all the way through February. We start increasing flows in March. Um, typical high flows occur mid-May to June um, with some other spikes going from um, kind of snowfall events, late wet snowfall event, events in the early spring and late winter. So to talk a little bit about the impairments um, of East Canyon Creek, the reasoning kind of behind our restoration. In 2002 and 2010, the state of Utah listed East Canyon Creek under a TMDL document. So that stands for total maximum daily load. What that essentially means is that the creek wasn't meeting uh, water quality requirements for the beneficial uses that the state had listed as um, East Canyon Creek's uses. What these documents really highlight um, is that there's high nutrient loads within the stream. Uh, there's decreasing stream flow, both due to climate change impacts on um, snowfall, but also uh, withdrawals for irrigation and municipal use. There's a lack of riparian vegetation, which you can see um, on this photo pretty well. And then simplified stream habitat. Um, all these factors kind of combined to produce a state of the stream where temperatures and dissolved oxygen concentrations are limiting cold water fishes. That is to say, temperatures are getting too warm and dissolved oxygen is getting too low to really support the fish that the state was expecting to see in the stream. A lot of this can kind of be traced back to historical simplification of floodplains. So this is the south side of Swanner Preserve here in the bottom, and then the north side with East Canyon Creek running here. We're here at this little gold star, just kind of outside of Kimball Junction itself. And this is the stream in 1952 from some aerial photography. You can see it's generally a meandering system with all of these little brown, um, not brown, I guess more gray dots being willow patches. If we move forward to 10 years, we can see it's in quite a similar state, meandering system, lots of willow patches throughout the floodplain. However, if we jump forward a number of decades to 1997, you can see that there's been a pretty stark change in that the building of the highway here has actually um, encroached on the floodplain. There's been a berm created here and we have an artificially straightened stream to this reach. We have a general loss of willow activity from this middle section while we still have some willow upstream, or sorry, downstream and upstream. And then if we jump forward to the present day or the near modern day, we can see that that um, process is continuing. That, that simplification process is generally continued. We still have a straightened stretch, straightened reach through here and the limited number of willows in the area where they were lost um, in the previous three to four decades. To kind of give you a little more historical perspective, this is an 1869 map produced by the General Land Survey Office um, as part of the homesteading effort. Um, so just to orient you to what you're looking at, this section here is generally the south side of the preserve at Swanner. Um, and then this toll road on the map is actually modern day I-80 bisecting the preserve. And so what I'd like to point out here is two areas here on the south side of the preserve in Kimball Creek where there's some large um, complex stream habitats going on where we actually have distributaries where the stream is breaking up into multiple channels that in some cases could stretch for half a mile or more. A similar thing is going on at Silver Creek, the neighboring creek, where we have a really complex distributary network, kind of an interbranching system over there. And those just aren't present in the modern day um, East Canyon or Silver Creeks. There has been some previous restoration work. Um, so I kind of wanted to acknowledge that before talking about our project. 
There's been some extensive willow plantings and other woody riparian vegetation up here on the left using stinger water jets. And there's also been some bank revetments, which goals were to narrow the stream, kind of concentrate the water in one area, make it deeper and make it more difficult for the channel to be warmed. Um, simultaneously, the willows would shade out the channel and uh, kind of improve the conditions, temperature and dissolved oxygen wise for the cold water fish species that should be inhabiting the area. To kind of build on these, um, to build on these historical restoration goals, we wanted to go ahead, sorry, this it keeps coming back up. We wanted to go ahead and go through process-based restoration. So I'm gonna kind of walk you through that. We refer to that as PBR sometimes with this nice little logo. Um, so the idea behind process-based restoration is you take the symptoms that you're seeing and you link them directly to the processes that are causing those symptoms. Um, once you have that kind of causal link between symptoms and processes, you can better understand how to tailor your restoration to local sites. So picking a restoration action that will target those processes at that site. And then finally, you can define explicit measures of success. Um, so, you know, you're succeeding in your restoration goal when you have hit this level of temperature consistently or when you've gotten these fish back that you're looking for, et cetera. So to kind of run through that process at Swanner and on East Canyon Creek in particular, we have a photo here on the left-hand side that shows some artificially straightened stream habitat. You can see there's generally lacking in streamside vegetation that would be shading out the water column. Um, you can see there's a moderate level of incision because a lot of Swanner is that um, open wide floodplain kind of historically depositional valley. We turned to beaver as the natural choice to restore it because beaver would have been a dominant uh, process prior to land use change and modification that occurred in the 200 years before we showed up. Kind of in the early stages of this project, walking around Swanner, we identified that most of it was kind of a stage A or stage B in this diagram where we have some level of incision, not a lot of live floodplain vegetation to kind of shade out um, solar inputs. While some of it had more of this inset floodplain, um, not a lot of conic upper floodplain surface. So what we hope to do is move it along this continuum and work towards a place where we can start getting uh, complex channel features, get meanders back, get side channels, start recruiting woody vegetation to shade out the stream and um, generally raise the water table, which is diluted by this little blue line on these figures. So end goal would be get to F down here. So to kind of work this process-based restoration um, technique into our particular system, we have our symptoms of low levels of dissolved oxygen, increasing amounts of non-native fish species, high levels of nutrients, and lots of macrophytic uh, growth within the stream channel itself. And we link that to the process of essentially stream migration and stream floodplain connectivity. So there wasn't enough of either of those, which was leading to these symptoms. So we decided to tailor our restoration using beaver and beaver dam analogs. And then we defined some explicit uh, measures of success, some explicit goals, which I'll talk about in a second, but in uh, adaptive management um, capacity. So that if we're not meeting our goals, we can go back in, change things up um, in order to better meet our goals. So what this would look like under an optimal situation where we've um, reached our goals is we have complex floodplain um, interactions being driven by beaver dam analogs or beaver dams themselves. We're leading to increases in the recruitment and establishment of woody vegetation like willows and cottonwoods. These overbank flows are depositing nitrogen heavy particles and we're having uh, denitrification occurring within the floodplain sediments themselves. This would hopefully lead to less uh, sorry, more dissolved oxygen, so better habitat for native fishes like our Bonneville cutthroat trout. So with the kind of need for restoration set up, we'll move ahead and talk in specific about beaver dam analogs at Swan. So what is a beaver dam analog, a BDA? Essentially, what a BDA is, it's taking untreated wooden fence posts fence posts and pounding them about a meter, so three to four feet into the stream bed itself. 
Um, you establish a line of posts. Once you have that line set up, you can go through on the back side. So the direction of flow is going from left to right. You can go through on the back side and start adding gravel, cobble, preferably some big boulders too, to kind of stabilize that structure and prevent it from being scoured. Once you have that nice kind of bedrock set up, you can start weaving willows into the structure, both um, perpendicular to the flow, so across the structure and parallel to the flow to form what's called a mattress. So what that does is it allows water that's flowing over the top and falling down to have a little bit of breakup in its velocity so that you're not just scouring backwards and undercutting your own structure with the hydraulic currents that you're creating with the dam itself. Um, and then optimally you build these with um, kind of natural on-site materials and you end up getting a structure like this on the right hand side that looks quite a lot like a real beaver dam except for the big posts sticking out that anchor it to the bottom. But those are just made of natural materials, natural wood without any chemicals. So when they decompose eventually, it won't be a big deal. So to sort of illustrate that process a little better, this is us building a beaver dam analog actually on East Canyon Creek. You can see us nailing in the posts here using a hydraulic post pounder. We start on the floodplain on the left-hand side. And then we work all the way up to the floodplain on the right hand side so that we can anchor this thing really well in. And now you see us weaving. We skipped the part where we were actually adding rocks and such, but you can see us start weaving horizontally across the stream and laterally with the stream to create that mattress. And you can see these folks with the orange buckets are actually delivering sediments and sands to really start filling in that dam. And you can see the water level begin to increase there. So now that we know how to build them, um, where, oops. Now that we know how to build them, um, we need to establish where should we build them. So we really kind of came up with four tenets of where to build them. Um, the first one to, was to reinforce, reinforce some existing projects. So as I mentioned earlier, there is some uh, floodplain vegetation, some woody riparian vegetation, like willows and cottonwoods that were planted, and there were some bank revetments that occurred. There was also some early beaver dam analog projects that just installed a beaver dam analog or two around. So this is a photo of one of the ones that was installed, I believe, in 2016 or 2017. Um, and it actually blew out to the left-hand side over here and scoured this area out and created a new bar over here, which we call a win. But we really liked what was going on there with increasing the sinuosity in this artificially straightened reach. So we built another three BDAs that you can see in this photo. There's one here. There's actually one across this side channel. And then there's a big one that goes all the way across. Additionally, we wanted to target areas with healthy willows. So this is a photo of um, our eventual East Canyon Creek BDA project before we built it. But you can see there's some nice patches of healthy willows. The desire to target these patches with BDAs was um, multifaceted. First off, it would make harvesting the willows for actually building them quite easy. And second off, it would provide us with a seed source and a propagule source for either naturally or artificially establishing more of these vegetation types uh, along the floodplain themselves. Additionally, we wanted to pick low gradient streams with lower levels of incision and wide floodplains so that we could maximize the water storage in the uh, floodplain and the sediment itself. So these are actually just some diagrams that we used when we were getting our permit to do this project of Kimball Creek, but you can see it's got a really nice, really wide floodplain. There's no infrastructure that could potentially be damaged. And we have lower levels of incision of about a meter that could easily be reached. We could easily raise the level of the water to reach the floodplain um, with a single treatment beaver dam analog. So just in a photo, our restoration goal was sort of to go from this side on the left and spend 10, 15, maybe 20 years to get to this side on the right. Um, you'll note that we looking for kind of iterative water table increases as we start storing more water in the channel itself and then also into the floodplain sediments. Additionally, we're getting the stream to move. You can see these new bars and these erosional patches that are being developed while simultaneously recruiting either natural floodplain vegetation or planting it ourselves. Um, hopefully we don't have to do this whole process by ourselves and eventually beaver will come in and accelerate the process, start creating some islands and we'll end up with a very multi-threaded complex and a branching 
um, channel at the end of the day. So some project goals that are more specific, more in words, we kind of set out um, to accomplish were to diversify the fluvial processes. So just, yeah, enhance the areas of deposition and erosion to get the stream to meander, to get it out of its um, channel and onto the floodplain. We wanted to enhance habitat for native species. So particularly wanted to increase late season stream flow because as we talked about earlier, stream flow is declining um, in East Canyon Creek. We wanted to decrease the variance in water temperature. So essentially stabilize water temperature so that it's at a more optimal temperature and not fluctuating um, wildly between season and day. And then we wanted to increase the nighttime dissolved oxygen. So a big thing that the TMDLs highlighted was that dissolved oxygen was essentially plummeting at night due to too much primary productivity in the stream. So what happens when you have a lot of primary productivity is you have a lot of macrophytes and whatnot growing in addition to your organisms, your fish and your invertebrates and such in the stream. And when they're all respiring together at night, they crash the dissolved oxygen levels. Um, in order to kind of get these other Process is going up on top. We wanted to recruit some woody riparian vegetation, help shade the stream, so uh, increase that dissolved oxygen and you know, decrease the temperatures. And then we wanted to promote colonization of main stem habitat by beaver. There's plenty of beaver around, but they're not typically inhabiting the main stem. They're um, more dwelling on tributaries at the very, very top of the, of the basin. So to accomplish these goals, we built a restoration plan, which was generally reinforcing the existing projects. We wanted to build two new heavily monitored complexes um, with five to six BDAs each. We wanted to monitor those complexes along with control reaches that were upstream from them and a natural beaver complex um, to kind of compare our man-made ones to a natural beaver one. And we wanted to link some restoration reaches together, um, work with other property owners in the area to expand our restoration uh, kind of effects beyond just the reach scale and start seeing some basin wide scale uh, effects. So as I mentioned, um, we had some heavy, heavily monitored sites and those, will, those six sites are what I'll be talking about for the remainder of this talk. So I'm gonna go ahead and kind of run through what we were monitoring and where they are. Um, so what we were monitoring was the fish community. Um, then we also were looking at kind of riparian ecosystem dynamics or function, um, particularly with some groundwater wells, some stream temperature loggers, and some dissolved oxygen loggers. We wanted to monitor the topography of the stream. So we conducted topography surveys with high accuracy GPS units, essentially survey grade GPS. Um, and then we used satellite and drone imagery to track changes from above. And then finally for our occupancy goal, um, for getting beaver back into the main stem, we uh, monitored their occupancy with surveys every fall. So as I mentioned, we had six heavily monitored sites and they're outlined here in different colors. And I'll kind of walk you through that real quick. We have East Canyon Creek. Um, so these red sites are actually BDA reaches while the teal ones are the control reaches. So we have East Canyon Creek's uh, BDA reach up here and the control reach here. Throughout the talk in some figures, I'll be referring to that as ECC3 and ECC3C, just in case you see those, you'll know what that means. Um, we also had Kimball Creek, so it had a BDA reach up top and then a control reach down below. And I forgot to mention, but generally the flow of water comes this way from south to north, uh, what would that be, northwest. Um, and then finally, we have McLeod Creek. So McLeod Creek has a natural beaver complex that we monitored and then an associated upstream control reach. And I delineate those as MC1BV standing for beaver and MC1C for control. There's one more that will pop up and that is the new beaver complex that actually just popped up in the last two years right next to the Eco Center on Spring Creek. So I call that one SWBV in a few figures just to denote the Swanner beaver colony. So with that all out of the way, let's jump into the meat of this talk. We will talk about our restoration results. So before I kind of jump into the, the meat of the results, I wanted to kind of set the stage by talking a little bit about the monitoring years and getting to some of the kind of basal characteristics of the stream over the course of this year. So our monitoring started in 2019. So we essentially have 
one summer before our BDAs were installed and one summer after for most of these metrics. Um, the summer before, so 2019 was an above average flow year and then the two years after were below average flow years. So I'll kind of talk about that in a little bit, but um, just to kind of get you acquainted with the system, this is the different stream gauges that we have access to in Snyderville Basin near to um, Swanner. And we have the A80 stream gauge, which is the closest to all of our restoration sites. I should have mentioned this. And so I guess I'll just go back and show it to you. But that I80 stream gauge is actually right here in between the two restoration complexes. And then we have the Jeremy Ranch stream gauge, which is the farthest downstream in the McLeod Creek stream gauge. So you can generally see that Jeremy Ranch is the farthest downstream, so it carries the most water. On McLeod Creek, highest upstream carries the least water. There's a little bit of variance in that, but that's the general pattern. Um, what you can note is that you know the trend for this discharge is that it's generally decreasing as we go through time. Um, the I-80 stream gauge didn't come online until 2010, so that's why there's no data before that. But We'll look at this in a different way. So this is mean annual discharge. So that's the average discharge for each day across in a total year. And this is only for the I-80. So the one that's closest to Swanner actually kind of within our restoration reaches. This shows you just below average and above average flows for the last 10 years that this stream gauge has been operational. What you can see right away is that there haven't been very many above average flows. There's essentially been three flood events in the last 10 years. And the only recent one was 2019 and 2017, which were actually relatively small magnitude. Um, also of note, 2021, the most recent year was the lowest flow year on record for that I-80 stream gauge. So we are getting lower flows um, than is historically, than have historically been present in the system. Another important variable to think about is stream temperature. So this is just the temperature from those um, USGS stream gauges. And it's the I-80 stream gauge in black and the Jeremy Ranch stream gauge in turquoise. We've got years here on the x-axis and degrees Celsius on the y-axis. What you can see right away is that Jeremy Ranch has just shifted a few degrees up. So it's a few degrees warmer at the Jeremy Ranch stream gauge than it is at the I-80 stream gauge. Important to note though is how warm um, 2021 is. That's uh, the only year where we're really seeing the I-80 stream gauge get into the 20, 22 degrees C um, sphere. And that's mainly just due to the lack of water in the stream, allowing the stream water to actually warm up pretty quick. So now that we've kind of set that stage, the first thing I want to show you is just some before and after, mainly like a photo, photo analysis of kind of before and after some of the BDAs. So to get a lot of this imagery, it's mainly drone collected. We collected images and still videos for purposes like this. We also collected top down photos, mainly for mapping purposes. So we actually process those top down photos into ortho imagery, which is a fancy, fancy word for a large, very large image that's stitched together with hundreds to thousands of photos. You can make ortho images that are several acres to several miles in extent. Um, and from those ortho images, you can actually produce what's called a digital terrain model. So that just shows you the elevation of all items within the landscape. So that would include things like trees, that would include things like uh, buildings, et cetera. So it differs a little bit from your classic elevation model in that it's not the surface of the earth, it's rather the surface, uh, including things above the earth. And we maintained accuracy for these things, for these products, for these data products, the ortho images and the digital, digital terrain models by using ground control points that we referenced with GPS. So we essentially pinned those images to the earth using known coordinates. So, to start first by talking a little bit about the East Canyon Creek Complex or ECC3. So this is ECC3 prior to the Beaver Dam analogs being installed. You can see stream flows going down this way. You generally have a meandering um, channel with some healthy willows along the side. Uh, um, this first photo is actually taken in 2019 in May. So it's like just starting to green up. This is actually a photo from October of 2020. And what you can see here is even though we have lower stream flows in October of 2020, we have significantly more water in this area 
um, kind of ponding up this peninsula that existed out here in 2019. And we're starting to get water back into the willows themselves, which hopefully would aid them in their growth. Another good imagery comparison comes from Kimball Creek. So this is the site of the Kimball Creek BDAs prior to their installation. Uh, another photo from May of 2019. We have stream flow coming from the right going to the left. And you can see, even though we're at relatively high flow at a high flow year, there is no water actually leaving the stream and going on to the floodplain. And this is the same exact um, spot in 2020 after the installation of the BDA. So you can see there's a BDA here, there's one here, there's one here, there's one here, and there's one here. And there's a pretty drastic change in terms of um, floodplain interactions that are occurring. We have overbank flows coming out this way, overbank flows out to the right, and then some even across this little area. So we've really increased kind of the connectivity between the stream and its floodplain just over the course of pretty much one year. To show that in video form, I will go ahead and show you this. This is from March of 2020. We're now flying upstream against the direction of flow, entering the beaver complex, and you can see immediately the uh, floodplain connectivity that's going on due to the BDAs. Now, as soon as we pass that last dam, we're entering an area that is no longer influenced by the BDAs, and you can immediately see the drop in water level and then a corresponding lack of connection to the floodplain that's occurring. So we will count that as our photo analysis and move on to a more kind of traditional structured data part of the talk. So I'm going to talk now about stream temperature, but instead of just being from USGS gauges, we're going to talk about temperature loggers that we deployed at each of our six heavily monitored sites. So these temperature loggers recorded the water temperature at 15 minute time intervals, and they were deployed, generally speaking, from June through October, although some were um, deployed a little later than that, particularly in that first 2019 year. We had about five at each of the sites each year, but sometimes um, we lost them or they were swept downstream, so we didn't always recover uh, all five data points. So this first graph I'm going to show you, I'll just kind of orient you. So this on the x-axis is just the time of the year from June to October. And then we have temperature in degrees Celsius going up the y. Um, and then each of these is just a logger name. Um, essentially, we start out in the, in the warmer colors. And those are all the downstream loggers in East Canyon Creek itself. And then we move into cooler colors being at the top of McLeod Creek. So McLeod 2 is the control reach. For McLeod and MC1 is the uh, beaver reach for McLeod. And these are the exit loggers. So that means that I just pulled out the last logger from a complex. So this is the water temperature as it's exiting a reach or a beaver dam or a beaver complex itself. So what we can see in 2019 is that as we'd expect, as we move downstream, i.e. as we get warmer in these colors, we're getting warmer water temperatures. Um, the important thing to note or something important to note here is that there is a difference, i.e. a warming trend between the, the control reach for, um, for McLeod and the actual beaver reach that we were monitoring, the real beaver dams. And there's not really a ton of trend. We see a, a small amount of warming between some of the, um, the pre-BDA reach, because this is 2019 before we saw, installed them. So the pre-BDA reach and their control reaches. Um, that would be ECC15 and ECC5, KC1, KC15. Um, so yeah, they're generally, the reaches are generally tracking each other between treatment and control. If we move forward one year to 2020, so this is after we installed the Beaver Dam analogs, we can see a fairly similar pattern is occurring. Um, the coloration is the same. So these are the same sites, the same exit loggers. And we can see that there's a little bit of separation again between the natural beaver dam and the, its control reach, meaning there's some warming occur occurring there. There's some very minor separation between these two green lines, indicating that there's a tiny bit of warming occurring between the BDAs and its control reach. But we have a bigger uh, separation between 
the BDAs in its control region East Canyon than we do in Kimball Creek. Um, so we're seeing about a quarter to a half a degree of warming, which is very similar to the amount of warming that we're seeing in the actual fever dam. If we move forward to 2020, we can see that the, sorry, 2021, we can see that the whole system is just drastically warmer. We essentially increase all the temperatures by about three degrees Celsius, which is pretty massive. Um, you get a maximum temperature coming out of the BDA complex at East Canyon Creek of 22.5 plus degrees C, which is pretty warm. But once again, the pattern of warming between the beaver dams and the beaver dam analogs is actually quite similar, where the separation between the control and the dam's reach is of similar magnitude and intensity, and they uh, follow each other throughout. Um, so one other way that we can look at this data is actually look at change in temperature from the top of our monitoring section. So from the top of the control reach in the cloud, all the way down to the bottommost section at East Canyon Creek BDA. So this is the 2019 data from before. And what we have here is a change in temperature. And this is just a distribution plot. So it's similar to a histogram, but it's smoothed and standardized where one is the most likely to occur and zero is never occurring. So what we can see from this plot is that there's um, very little warming that actually happens in terms of degrees change between McLeod and the Beaver complex, while we get a spike in the Kimball Creek complex that comes up to about 1.75 degrees C and a much bigger spike in East Canyon of about three degrees C. And this is before we installed any Beaver Dam analogs. So we can think of this as kind of the natural um, capacity for warming that the system has as you're moving downstream and going through areas that have more and less vegetation interacting with upwelling and downwelling of the stream system and having springs come in tributaries and the like. Now, if we move forward to 2020, we see that um, the Cloud Creek, the Beaver Complex is a very similar signal. It hasn't changed very much, but now we have all these other um, images, or sorry, not images, all these other colors overlaid. Um, and one thing to note is that we have a we have a lower water year in 2020. So this X axis is extended farther out. We're getting warmer into the four and five degree range. Whereas in 2019, we had more water and we were only getting warmer into warming into about the three degree range. A lot of these are bimodal, which is pretty interesting. So um, we'll start with this top most one, the control reach for for Kimball Creek, you can see that there's actually a little spike um, that occurs that's slightly cooling. So sometimes there's a cooling effect in the Kimball Reach, but the majority of the time we're seeing a little bit of warming around two degrees. Um, and its treatment reach where the BDAs are is almost exactly the same as, as it is. There's like a tiny bit of offset by maybe a 10th to a 20th of a degree Celsius, so not much. However, between East Canyon and its control reach, there's more of an offset, um, maybe about half a degree. So there's more warming um, that's happening in the East Canyon and its control reach than there is in the Kimball uh, reach and its control reach. Now, if we compare that same 2020 plot to the 2021 distribution, we can see that just everything was shifted, kind of phase shifted to the right while we have very similar patterns. So this is going back to 2021, just had less water and was more warm than 2020 was. Um, all three of them together, just to show you kind of the differences between years. But really the take homes from this is 2021, low water year, um, regardless of site or treatment effects, the water was just really warm because there wasn't a lot of it and it was quite a warm year in terms of temperature as well. The pattern of warming um, from the before period, so in 2019 and the after period, 2020 to 2021, is very similar. So we're not seeing drastic changes by adding the BDAs. We're seeing maybe a quarter to a half a degree of warming being caused by the BDAs. Interestingly, that um, BDA, BDA associated warming is a very similar magnitude and offset um, temporally to the natural beaver dams. So it seems like that um, kind of process is being very well emulated by the Beaver Dam analogs themselves. And then the Kimball Creek control to BDA warming is less pronounced than the East Canyon Creek to its um, control to BDA warming. 
I think a big reason for that could just be the size. East Canyon Creek is a wider stream, um, so it's, it's able to kind of absorb more sunlight. And another big thing is Kimball Creek has a lot of upwelling springs and potentially more potential to store cold water within its floodplain surfaces. So it could just be a combination of factors that's causing that. So for temperature, we're gonna jump into some topographic surveys and we'll talk a little bit about those. Um, so I use what's called a real-time kinetic GPS, a survey grade GPS to survey each of our six heavily monitored sites in 2020 and 2021. Um, we surveyed both the BDA sites, so East Canyon Creek and Kimball Creek in 2019 as well. From those, we built 3D maps of each site using GIS software. And from those maps, we calculated the water depths and then we calculated sediment budgets, essentially estimating areas where erosion and deposition had occurred. To kind of show you that process. This is one of our topo survey, um, just the raw points. The background being some drone imagery that we collected on that same day. So you can see here in the blue, this is the Thalwag, the fastest, deep, deepest section of the stream. In the yellow, we have these bounding um, kind of maximum bankful areas. And then in the pink all around are just topographic points that help us illustrate not only the floodplain, but also things like um, deep pools and riffle sections by collecting topographic data. Uh, we additionally, we collected side channel and kind of other constraining features if they were present. From that data, we could create um, a digital elevation model or a DEM, and that's what these contoured lines are. So we have a DEM or a physical model of the surface, both of the stream and of the floodplain. And from that DEM, we could actually calculate water depths because we knew the elevation of where the edge of the water was and we knew the depth that the surface went down. So we could essentially subtract them to get water depth. And that allows us to really pull out where pools are and illustrate where riffles are and kind of see you know, different features like this glide that goes around this bank. Additionally, um, we had the digital terrain model that I mentioned before. So that would show us the elevation of the vegetation. So you can see like these are really tall willow stands while this is just flat grass. And then we have the very flat highway and such. Kind of show you a little more um, how this process worked. I'm just going to show you this short clip. So this is actually as part of creating the digital elevation model for Kimball Creek. We used what's called a triangular um, irregular network, the TIN for short. We took all our points and we interpolate between points to create this model. We can go through then and find errors or places where we have misinterpolations um, occurring to correct those before we actually go in and calculate our statistics on water depth and sediment and deposition. You can actually see some of the BDAs in there. This is the 2020 data for Kimball Creek. Okay, so to the actual data. This is water depth data for East Canyon Creek's BDA section. Um, on the left-hand side here, you have some maps where darker colors are deeper water, lighter colors are more shallow water. And on the top section, we have our 2020 data. And on the bottom section, we have the 2021 data. Um, additionally, we have the wetted area being calculated up here in meters, that's meters squared. So what we can see is that the BDA section has um, pretty deep uh, pretty deep water throughout with a really big deep pool here. And actually between 2020 and 2021, we have a little more wetted area, which is interesting because we had a low flow year in 2021. So I think that kind of points to our efforts to maintain and rebuild these BDAs um, whenever they needed it optimally multiple times per year. On the right-hand side over here, we actually just have a histogram. So this is the frequency of different depths occurring. And you can see a very similar thing going on where between 2020 and 2021, we have a slightly deeper um, distribution of depths than we did in 2020. So 2021 was a little bit deeper, even though there was less water in the system, thanks to our uh, maintenance efforts on these BDAs. 
Now, if we can pair that to the control reach, so these reaches are the exact, uh, just about the exact same length. So they're very comparable between one another. We can instantly pull out that this um, control reach is much shallower across both years, just based on the colors in this plot. Additionally, the wetted area is about half of what it is in the BDA reach. So we have just less area of ha aquatic habitat that we're dealing with, which is important when you're talking about things like invertebrate and fish communities. And then the distribution of depths is just much shallower overall. So you know, the average depth is only about 0 0.3, 0 0.4 meter in the control reach, while it's getting up to 0 0.5, 0 0.6 plus in the um, treatment reaches where the BDAs are themselves. Another good way to look at this is actually just a box and whisker plot. So in this, we have uh, East Canyon, 2020 on the left-hand side, 2021 on the right. The lower panel here is actually the control reach and the upper panel is the treatment reach where we installed the BDAs. These are box and whisker plots. So the middle stripe here is actually the median and the box is the inner quartile range. So 75 to 25% of the measurements are contained within that. And then the whiskers are about 100 to uh, zero with outliers or those deemed not um, similar to the data set as actual points. So what we can see um, is between 2020 and 2021, we're actually increasing water depth on average in the BDA reach, even though it's decreasing in the control reach because there's less water in the system between 2020 and 2021. If we look at Kimball Creek, we have a very similar pattern occurring here where we're increasing the water depth by a little bit in the treatment reach, even though we have less water and less depth in the control reach due to there being less water in the system. Very similar thing happens at the McLeod, um, at the McLeod reaches where we have the natural beaver dam. It has almost identical depth distribution, but with more outliers in 2021 than it does in 2020. Whereas there's almost no change, there's like a slight increase here, but we have, um, we have tons of outliers in this data set for the control reach in the cloid. So the takeaways from our water depths. Um, so water depths are significantly deeper between dams and their controls. Dams are on average 21 centimeters deeper than the controls are. The wetted areas are significantly deeper, or sorry, significantly different between the dams and the controls with 500 meters squared greater wetted area in dammed sites than in controlled sites. Then when we compare the water depths from BDAs to the beaver dams, they were not significantly different. So the BDAs are doing a good job of replicating the water depths from our natural complex. However, the wetted areas are significantly different between the BDAs and the beaver dams. Um, there's about 485 meters squared greater wetted area in the beaver sites than there are in the BDA sites. And I would attribute a lot of that to beavers' um, capacity to dig canals and kind of engineer their aquatic habitat to better suit themselves, which is something that beaver dam analogs are very poor at because humans don't want to go out there every day and dig canals and um, refill dams and help patch dams and the like. Even though we were doing our best to maintain these multiple times a year, we don't quite replicate the, <clears throat> the area influence that the beaver dams themselves are doing. So on from the water depths, we're going to talk a little bit about sediment budgets using geomorphic change detection. So the idea here is pretty much we take that new digital elevation model, the most recent one, and we subtract from it the old one, and we get a DEM of difference or DOD. Um, <clears throat> and what that allows us to do is highlight pixels in blue where there's deposition occurring and in red where there's erosion occurring. And we have pixels in gray where either our data isn't good enough, there's too much uncertainty for us to be confident about erosion or deposition, or there's just nothing happening. Um, so I'll show you a few maps and then we'll talk a little bit more about that data. So this is the East Canyon Creek um, BDA reach comparing the 2019 versus the 2020 DEM. And what pops out right away, at least to me, are all these big blue spots. And these are actually the locations of the BDAs themselves. So we have a calculation for how much material we actually added to the stream with the BDAs. Um, you can see that there's some deposition occurring between some BDAs. It's a big uh, patch of gravel. We can see there's some occurring behind some of the BDAs. 
And then generally we can see that there's some um, erosional processes happening, although not a lot. There's some scouring out some deep pools. There's some scouring some kind of side cut uh, habitat around a meander bend and similarly down here. If we look at that same site, but compare the 2020 to the 2021 um, DEM of difference, you can see a fairly similar process happening. Um, however, there's kind of less magnitude, the colors are less intense, meaning the changes that are occurring are generally less substantial in terms of elevational differences. I forgot to mention this in the other one, but you could probably have um, read it, but essentially as the colors get more intense, we're talking about more deposition in meters or more erosion in meters. So yeah, this was just to kind of compare the two to show you that the process is happening were relatively similar, all but with kind of some more intense colors occurring in the 2019 to 2020 comparison versus the 2020 to 2021 comparison. Another good way to look at this is actually a histogram, so a distribution of values. Um, so this is the 19 to 20 DEM of difference for East Canyon Creek on the left and for Kimball Creek on the right. We have the same kind of coloration going on where the stronger the color, the more deposition or erosion in terms of um, in terms of uh, elevational change. And so you can see for both of these is we kind of have a stronger tail on the right hand side than we do on the left. So we're seeing more deposition because of the VDAs than we are seeing erosion. And both of these are yeah the treatment sites because we only surveyed um, in 2019 we only surveyed the Beaver Dam and Alons themselves. Now, if we move forward, um, we can kind of talk about the 2020 versus 2021 DEMs of difference for all of our sites. So on the left-hand column here, we have all the treatment sites, including the Beaver Dam natural one. And on the right-hand side, we have all of the control sites. Um, so we'll start off talking about East Canyon Creek. And we can see that there's generally a mixed signal with a about equal amounts of deposition and erosion occurring in the East Canyon Creek BDAs versus the control reach. There's a little more deposition than erosion, but they're pretty similar, um, not, not very different in terms of being heavily skewed towards erosion or deposition. If we look at the Kimball Creek site, pretty similar stories going on. We have a kind of a wash for deposition and erosion if we calculate it volumetrically. Almost nothing is being exported um, in terms of total import exports. And then if we look at the control reach, similar story, there's a little more erosion, but we're, we have very similar um, processes going on. And McCloyd or McLeod, um, the story is pretty much the same as well. Uh, these kind of graphs overlay fairly similar in terms of depositional and erosional processes. So kind of the takeaways here, is that most of the deposition in the BDA reaches is centered around the BDAs themselves, meaning a lot of the deposition was probably us actually moving in, um, moving in physical volume of wood and sediment and the like and putting it in the stream. And some of that actually helped capture other sediment, but um, it wasn't kind of a multi-year thing that went on in this system. Little change occurred in the following years um, in either the treatment, the natural beaver, or the controls. And I attribute a lot of that because we had two low flow years back to back. So there just wasn't a lot of sediment moving around in the system period due to low water velocities. Um, so there wasn't a lot of sediment for the beaver dam, the natural beaver dams, or the natural beaver dam analogs themselves to capture. So this is um, a kind of a classic case that if we came back and looked five years later, we may have a completely different story, but that's just the data that we have for the moment. Now on to fish communities, maybe the most um, exciting topic for some people. So we assessed fish communities using two pass electro fishing um, twice per year. So once in the spring and once in the fall. And when I say two pass electro fishing, what I mean is we went through the stream once, we caught all the fish that we could by running low voltage electricity through the water to stun them. We reserved these fish out of the stream by putting them in buckets with water and um, allowing that water to be aerated so the fish stayed happy and healthy. And then we made another pass through the stream, did the same exact thing, caught all those fish, kept them in second bucket, separate buckets so that we could tell pass one from pass two. 
Once we had done that, we collected biometrics like length and weight. Uh, we scanned fish for hit tags, which is passive integrative transponders. They're very similar. You know, they're exactly the same technology that your pet would have in order to be identified as your pet if it gets um, caught and taken to the pound. And so we would implant those in the fish if they didn't have them, or we would record the number um, of their tag if they did have. From this data, we calculated some population size estimates for each site of different fish. And then we calculated some growth rates for species across different sites. Um, so we're gonna start off with some population size estimates. We'll start talking about brown trout, but just to kind of orient you to these plots. So we have these six different columns and those correspond to our sites. We have East Canyon Creek BDA down here. It's control reach, Kimmel Creek BDA. It's control reach, McCloyd Creek beaver, natural beaver and then its control reach. And those generally correspond to being most upstream um, all the way up here and then moving downstream to get to East Canyon Creek at the bottom. At the top section, we have um, our spring survey. And then at the bottom section, we have our fall survey. We have different species broken out here, but it's actually the same species. We have in yellow, brown trout adults and in purple, brown trout juveniles. So we'll just start talking about this upper figure. We can see that we have an approximately equal distribution between the control reach for East Canyon, the BDA reach for Kimball, and then the natural beaver in terms of adult population of brown trout in the spring. Um, there's kind of a scattering of fish in other areas. Interesting kind of to note here is that um, the juvenile fish are actually concentrated in this BDA reach with some a little upstream in the control reach as well. Um, typically we found the most brown trout juveniles in the spring because brown trout, um, they spawn in the fall. And so you expect to see their juveniles out and about during the spring, more so than with other species who might uh, spawn in the spring. If we look down at the fall data, it looks quite similar. Um, we do get some more uh, fish that kind of move into the um, move into the natural beaver reach in the fall, and then we have a somewhat of an exodus of brown trout juveniles from the Kimball Creek BDA reach, and that could be due to predation or just moving to find better habitat. If we compare that to the 2021 data, we start to see some different and interesting patterns emerging. Um, similar patterns in terms of adult numbers. Although the East Canyon Creek uh, BDA section actually lost all of its adults, but what we really start to see is high levels of recruit of juveniles in both the spring and the fall to the Kimball Creek BDAs. Um, higher levels than we see in any of the other sites, even though the control reach gets um, fairly close. Interestingly, and potentially because it was a low water year, we see this huge spike in adults moving into the natural beaver complex, potentially just searching um, more high quality water um, that's created by the natural beaver complex there as they move out of a more stream system and try and get into that complex to either overwinter, potentially uh, move upstream and spawn as well. The other large bodied fish that we have in this system is actually Utah sucker. So they're pretty cool fish. They were actually um, hunted for food by both the pioneers and the Native Americans. Um, and people, people said that they were so numerous on the Jordan River in particular that you could walk across the backs of them when you first showed up to the Salt Lake Valley. So we have a similar graph going here with um, downstream to upstream across here. The only difference really is the coloration. So the adult suckers are in cream color and the juvenile suckers are in more of this black color. Um, in the spring of 2020, we have lots of adults in both of our control reaches and then kind of a few in the um, BDA reach of East Canyon. The Suckers spawn in the spring, so there's not a lot of juveniles in the system yet when we do our electro fishing in the spring, and so we have pretty low sucker numbers throughout. Um, when we look at the fall data, then what we see is actually a lot of juveniles have started to move into those um, treatment reaches to where we built the BDA, so our highest number of juveniles are across here at East Canyon BDAs and Kimball BDAs, which is pretty cool to see. 
if we move forward to 2021, you can see similar processes going on. Um, the adults really like these control reaches. We have tons of adults in both the East Canyon and Kimball Creek controls with a kind of lower number of juveniles throughout. But when we look down at the fall, we actually see we've lost a lot of adults. Um, the adults are very large schooling fish and they're pretty susceptible to a variety of predators, particularly avian predators like hawks and osprey. So I suspect that this big decline that we're seeing here in the fall 2021 is like two years of low flow um, meant that lots of adults have been picked off by a variety of predators. The good news, I guess, is that we're seeing a huge pulse of recruitment. So we have this or potential recruitment. We have this massive 45 plus um, number of juveniles that are in the East Canyon Creek BDA reach and then a corresponding 15 to 20 occurring in the Kimball Creek BDA reach. Um, one thing I forgot to mention that I'll just say now is that we don't actually get any suckers in the upstream section in the cloud. Um, they're either blocked by passage constraints, which is something I'll talk a little bit about here in a second, or they just don't like that habitat because it's too cold, too small of a stream, something to that effect. There are some other fish species of interest in the stream, some smaller bodied individuals. We have mottled sculpin and red-sided shiner and speckled dace. So mottled sculpin is actually the yellow uh, denoted RMS on this one. And then we have shiner, which is NRS in teal and the speckled dace in purple. So we can see that um, in, once again, in the upstream reaches in McLeod Creek, we only have sculpin. The shiner and the dace either don't like it or can't get there. But throughout the other reaches, we have all three. Um, there's somewhat of an interesting pattern occurring that as you go farther downstream in 2020, both in the spring and the fall, you get more and more shiner, which is pretty, pretty interesting to see, sometimes 300 plus in some of these sites. Um, the days follow a somewhat similar pattern, but not quite as pronounced. However, if we look at the 2020 data, you can actually see that um, shiner numbers decreased and we saw an increase in speckled dace. So for whatever reason, whether it be the low water or maybe a habitat change relating to the macrophytic growth or something, the speckled dace did a lot better in 2021 than they did in 2020. So now I want to talk a little bit about growth rates. Um, so we calculated the growth rates essentially by looking at our pit tag data. So we had a moment when we marked them and then when we recaptured them, we knew how many days were in between and we knew their weight differences. So we could calculate how much they grew in grams per day on the y-axis um, over that time period. And I've separated them out for the moment by site. So we have all our different sites and um, those are color coded by treatment. So we have the BDA treatments in blue, the beaver treatments in gray and the control treatments in yellow. Um, up here at the top is actually our number of recaptures by site. So you can see some of these sites only have a few recaptures while some like the Beaver um, or the Kimball Creek Control have 30 plus recaptures. Um, yeah, this was just sort of to show you the different recaptures by site, but what is more of interest is actually the recaptures by habitat and then their corresponding growth rates. So this is all those sites collapsed into habitat. So we have all the BDA recapture fish here, all the beaver fish in the middle and control fish on the right. And once again, these numbers correspond to the number of uh, sampled individuals. We have our box and whisker plots. So just to remind you, that's the median in the middle. We've got the inner quartile range from 75% to 25%. And then the full two times inner quartile range in the whiskers plus our outliers as dots. Um, what might jump out to you right away is that the, the median here for the beaver reach is higher than either the BDA or the control reach. And it looks like the control reach is a little less than the BDA reach. Um, what these numbers, or sorry, what these letters signify is actually um, significant difference codes. So I ran an analysis of variance um, and then looked at actual significant differences between pairs. And what we found is that the beaver reach, um, we had fish growing significantly faster than either the BDA or the control reach. However, the BDA reach wasn't growing significantly faster than the control reach um, in a statistical sense. So we can't say that the BDA is approximating the growth um, provided by 
the natural beaver dams. Part of that might be due to temperature, part of that might be due to food source. Uh, that's something I'm looking a little bit more into as I continue down the, the research path of this project. We also have similar data for Utah sucker. Um, we have a lot fewer fish that we were able to recapture for sucker, as you can see by these numbers up here. So these are pretty similar plots just without the McLeod sites because they don't get up into McLeod. Um, one thing you'll notice is that some of these suckers have some large um, <laughs> negative growth rates. And the reason for that is a lot of the suckers that we are recapturing are very large adult fish. And so they're going through um, cycles of, of reproduction and uh, kind of adding fat and not fat, but adding uh, mass and losing mass, even though they're not changing in length much because they're adult. Um, unfortunately, we, we weren't able to recapture many juveniles as they grew, so we don't have very good data on the suckers. Um, in fact, when we break it out by, uh, when we break it out by habitat type, the data is so poor in terms of distribution, we only have three recaptures in the BDAs compared to 22 in the control. So these guys really prefer the control sites, at least as adults, um, to the BDA sites. So I, I can't compare these statistically due to sample size differences. So one more thing before we uh, move on and talk a little bit about some other stuff is to look at kind of migratory movement. So when we Essentially, we would tag a fish in one location, we might recapture it in another location. So that's what this uh, plot is broken down by, where we have the area where they were tagged or marked on the left, and then the area where they were recaptured on the right. We detected 22 migratory fish during our study, or fish that moved between different sites, which is pretty cool. Then we have these color-coded where brown trout is in blue, and the suckers are in yellow. So for our migratory fish, we had about an equal distribution for both brown trout and suckers in terms of where they were captured. However, where they were recaptured, we don't quite have the same um, equitable distribution. What we get is lots of recaptures of brown trout, particularly in control reaches, but with a decent amount in about four in the, um, in the treatment reach, in the BDA reach of Kimball Creek. Um, while most of the suckers are actually, they're, they're only moving a little bit. Um, what I was trying to say here is that the suckers tend to move a little bit downstream, it seems, based on this data, and the brown trout tend to move a little upstream. Um, I think part of that could be migratory for, uh, for spawning for the brown trout. They're moving upstream to find better spawning habitat, but another aspect um, could be just searching for better temperatures. Also of note is that new beaver complex that's right out the Eco Center in Swanner that I mentioned before, we did get a recapture of a fish uh, of a brown trout in there that we had previously tagged in the control reach for East Canyon, I believe. So um, this new beaver generated habitat is uh, preferable for the brown trout enough that they're kind of migrating to find it, even when it's brand new. So kind of my take homes for the fish community section is the BDAs appear to be enhancing um, juvenile production or at least providing juvenile habitat. That's particularly notable for Utah suckers in East Canyon Creek and notable for brown trout in Kimball Creek where we're seeing lots of, um, lots of juvenile fish inhabiting both of those. Um, growth rates for brown trout are significantly higher in beaver dams. Um, BDAs don't quite replicate this. And it could be a temperature thing where the water is just cooler due to the longitudinal position that the BDA reaches occupy in the watershed, i.e. You know, the natural kind of basal capacity for warming that the watershed has, as we showed you in that 2019 data from before the BDAs. The other is migration between um, McLeod and Kimball slash East Canyon Creek is not likely. <clears throat> in my opinion, that's likely due to diversions and dewatering of the stream. If you try and walk the stream, I don't think it flows clean most of the time between the two. So it's really hard, if not impossible, for fish to migrate up or downstream between those two in most years. And that could be a limiting factor actually for cutthroat trout. We only found in my three years of electro fishing at Swanner, we only found one cutthroat trout that was actually in that new beaver dam complex that was built outside of the Eco Center in 2021. 
we found that uh, lone guy. So that could be a limiting factor for cutthroat trout immigration um, because they are in the beaver dams upstream, but they aren't at, uh, they aren't currently in the stream around Swan Art Preserve. And then finally, brown trout more likely to migrate upstream than down. Um, I'm attributing that to spawning or temperature. I'm working more to kind of tease apart that relationship um, as I move forward with my analysis. So the final kind of uh, data result point I want to talk about was a little on beaver occupancy. As you might remember, one of our goals was to establish beaver on main stem habitat and kind of take our jobs in terms of maintaining and building these dams to help restore the system. In order to quantify occupancy uh, of beaver, we did fall surveys for signs of beaver. So our key signs were food caches, dam maintenance, and lodges. If we found two of the three of those at one of the sites, we classified that site as occupied. So we did these surveys actually for more than just our heavily monitored site sites. There was two other sites that had beaver dam analogs built on them prior to 2020. And then in 2021, there's a load more beaver dam analogs that were actually built in and around Swanner. Um, some 80% of the BDA sites had some form of beaver use. So one of those three, actually, let me back up for a second. So this little cartoon actually illustrates really well the three different signs that we were looking for. Um, this, this is a food cache here, which is a collection of sticks and willows kind of pounded into the mud by the beaver. Um, the reason they put them in the mud like that or like in the water column is it, it's twofold. First, it helps refrigerate the sticks, keep them um, kind of nice, good eating for beaver. And second, um, like in our climate in Utah, if the water is to freeze over, what it allows the beaver to do is actually still go underneath through their lodge and get some food source without you know, being stuck underneath the ice without any food. So that's the food cache. We have a lodge, which you all are probably familiar with. And then we would actually investigate dams themselves for active maintenance by a beaver, which we determined by looking at the placement of the sticks themselves, placement of mud, um, scent mounds around the area and the like. So as I was saying, some 80% of the BDA sites had some form of beaver use. So one of the three of these, um, two of the sites, the most downstream BDA site pictured here on the right, which I've been calling East Canyon Creek 1 and East Canyon Creek 2, were occupied by beaver in 2020 and 2021, um, respectively. And then there is that new colony that established on Spring Creek near the Eco Center that um, we didn't have anything to do with in a restoration sense. They just went out and found that site on their own. This little red circle actually shows you one of the lodges from aerial imagery. So these are some BDAs we installed. And then that same fall that we installed them, they actually came in and overtook it. Um, so this is a close up of that same lodge that I'm highlighting. This is kind of near the railroad car bridge um, that heads out on, I forget what that trail is called on Swanner, but if you're familiar with that railroad car bridge is near to that. And this is um, that same lodge with, you can see the beginning of their food cache. And I think this was taken uh, like early November, like November 4th or so of 2020. This is another photo. So this is the second one that was overtaken. Um, actually just the posts for the BDAs were installed at this site. And with the installation of the posts, the beaver thought that this was a great time to come in and take things over. So they built this lodge over here just underneath the ice dam and started filling in the posts without any other help um, from the Swanner or Sageland volunteers, which was pretty cool to see. And then finally, this is the SWBV site uh, or the Swanner Beaver site right next to the Eco Center. It's like they knew that it was an Eco Center and people would wanna check them out. So this is kind of their main primary dam and pond that backs up around this area and have a really big lodge right here that you can't quite see through the, um, through the willows there. So with that, I kind of want to move really quick into some lessons learned before I wrap up and talk a little bit about things moving forward, potentially. Um, so some lessons learned, and this is, I guess, mainly from my perspective. Um, the first thing is that um, when you're trying to restore a system, it may change in kind of unpredictable ways while you're in route to your end goal. So this little diagram shows that well, where maybe our end goal is here at three, and we are starting at one, but um, you know the desirable state is down here on the y-axis. We might actually have to move it uphill and make it 
less desirable from our human uh, monitoring perspective in order to get it over that hump and down to the restoration goal. I think we saw this in, in multiple ways. Um, some of them I can think of off the top of my head were kind of the depletion of adult fish in the East Canyon Creek um, BDA section. And that happened for a variety of reasons. I think most importantly, temperature and dissolved oxygen restriction. But until we get enough water onto the floodplain to start kind of diverting these, these channels into a multi-threaded form and start channel migration and establish this riparian vegetation in order to shade out that channel, things won't get better unless we kind of make them worse to, to kind of kickstart that restoration. To kind of um, carry along with that, multiple treatments are often needed and potentially treatment approaches in order to meet that goal. And then um, most of this monitoring has taken place over two years of fairly low flows. So without flat high flows, um, we can't expect a lot to change in terms of stream migration and, and actual changes to the structural forcing of the stream. And the reason behind that is there's just not enough velocity, there's not enough energy in the system to really be moving around these gravels and cobbles and cutting new channels into the floodplain. Um, there's, not, there's not enough of a force there. So if we came back and looked in 10 years and we had um, two or three big floods in those 10 years, we might see completely different results than we've seen at the moment. The other big thing, and you can see it really well in this photo, is this really light um, colored vegetation all throughout, kind of right next to the stream bake, is reed canary grass likely needs additional treatments in order to get some of this woody riparian vegetation established. If you're not familiar with reed canary grass, it is either a native invader or a fully invasive species, depending on who you ask. Um, but it's a really, it's a really kind of uh, aggressive species that takes over riparian areas. It chokes out other plants like our willows and cottonwoods that we're looking to recruit. And then it forms really, really dent, root, dense root mats that are highly resistant to erosion and actually prevent stream migration in a lot of cases. Um, so far, we've just tried to treat it by essentially flooding it out, adding more dams and of flooding water in the system and that has worked to a certain extent but it doesn't quite have the um, aerial or the area uh, of impact that we'd like to see to really recruit some woody riparian vegetation so additional treatments might be something like laying down tarps to actually kill it physically or herbicide treatments um, potentially constant mowing potentially grazing yeah, there's some other options out there. Um, this is one project in Washington. They actually put down tarps to eliminate reed canary and then planted willows and cottonwood directly into that tarp um, so that they could access the water while reed canary couldn't grow up and through. So that could be a potential, potential option, especially for some of these point bars that we'd like to recolonize. The other thing is that sub yearly maintenance is really needed to ensure that the BDAs are actually mimicking beaver dams. So beaver are constantly maintaining their dams and so should we, but we don't quite have the time to do that. So we need to maintain them as often as possible in order to really reap those benefits um, like natural beaver dams are providing. I think we did a pretty good job of that over the course of our study, but um, a lot of beaver dam analog projects don't go back frequently enough, if at all. So I think that's something important to remember when going through a restoration process like this. And then finally, um, building with some non-traditional materials, things that aren't typically mentioned in the restoration community for beaver dam analogs, such as old Christmas trees or coconut fiber erosion mats, can really increase your efficiency. It can really increase the bang for your buck. Some of the most important dams in terms of connecting to the stream to the floodplain were actually built primarily with Christmas trees and erosion mat. What the erosion mat really did, I think, from my perspective, was it emulated the mud packing that beaver do by just trapping all these particulates on the dam itself. So the dams that we laid a coconut fiber erosion mat on tended to be uh, more watertight, more sealed, and thus put more water out onto the floodplain flood plain than the ones we built without erosion mat. And like I said, not a lot of people are doing that. It would be interesting to see how this erosion mat technique would actually hold up under higher flows. It might create more drag and be more prone to blowing out. But an important thing when you're trying to diversify the hydraulic and habitat structure of a stream is that blowouts of your restoration structures 
I actually should think of those as a good thing. That's the stream realigning itself. Um, so, you know, you're not the one in charge, uh, typically in a restoration. You're just trying to provide it with the boost that it needs to get from one um, degraded state to a more, to a more uh, kind of natural or more uplifted state, if you will. And then moving forward, um, so there's continued efforts on Swanner to maintain the existing BDA complexes that we have, that sub yearly maintenance that I've been harping on about, expand them potentially by installing dams upstream and downstream, um, install new BDAs when they blow out, particularly at those heavily monitored and those older complexes. There's an active effort by Rhea, her conservation team, and some other um, volunteers to plant willow stakes, cottonwood poles, and other desirable riparian shrubs along the riparian corridor to help kind of accelerate this process of colonization and encourage shading of the stream itself. And then there's some expansion um, of BDA projects kind of throughout Snyderville Basin and some log jam projects as well. There's been a big effort by Schwanner to start adding some BDAs to their in intermittent streams to so start trying and store some water in the um, in the floodplain soils that are actually upstream of the main stem kind of help prolong that base flow and then being led uh, I believe by the um, Sageland Collaborative is an effort to actually build some BDAs on the main stem down at Bad Apple Eddy or not Bad Apple Eddy Bad App, App, Apple Trailhead near the water treatment plant um, on East Canyon Creek itself. So with that, I'd like to just give a huge shout out to all people who kind of allowed this work to happen. Um, in particular, we've got Rhea and Nell from Swanner, uh, Janice from Sageland Collaborative, we've got Hunter and Katie from Swanner and Alex as well from Swanner. And then all my texts of the year, um, Jaron, Reggie, and then good old Cobb, Jacob. <laughs> And uh, special thanks also to all the people who helped fund this. We got the people I mentioned in the beginning, but Gillen Water H2O uh, lent us a bunch of loggers and really, really helped us, I think, in our early years, as well as um, the DNR. So both the um, both UGS, the Geological Survey, and uh, Wildlife Resources both donated some time and money to help us keep the BDAs built, maintained, and kind of up to snuff. Um, can't say enough about the Ecology Center for helping me with some money and uh, Utah State University Department of Watershed Sciences, um, Sageland again have been awesome really helping get the volunteers out to to actually build and maintain these structures and then the Department of Environmental Quality provided us with some crucial funds to actually buy posts and other materials that we needed to build the BDAs themselves. And with that I'd like to thank you all for coming particularly you Nye guy and uh, I'd like to thank oh I forgot to thank the beaver himself and Greg Goodrum, who was my honorary technician, volunteered tons of time. So yeah, with that, thanks for coming, y'all. Um, and I'll take any questions. Thanks so much, Marshall. So cool to see all that data um, kind of come together after our years of work. So commend you putting this together and, and the three years of uh, data collection that we have done. Um, and we have some time for a few questions, so I will field some of those. And I don't know if we will get to all of them, but I also want to um, just kind of put out there that you can always contact Marshall directly or myself with any questions too. So if you think of something later, if you're watching this recording later um, and you have questions, feel free to reach out. Um, and so one question from Michael, who is a beaver believer and has helped build some of these BDAs on the preserve, um, said, if he recalls correctly, one of the BDA goals was to improve the water table kind of adjacent to the stream bed. Um, any kind of indicators along these lines? Yeah, so I didn't include that data just due to time. I didn't realize how long that took. I didn't have my uh, I didn't have my little watch going. But yes, um, the BDAs immediately kind of pump the water table, increase the increase the depth of the water table, so that is get the water closest closer to the surface. We have some groundwater well data that shows within about three to four days of the BDA installs in 2019, we were seeing water tables nearly at the surface of the soil um, up to about 50 to 100 meters away from the stream itself. So it's pretty instantaneous 
and it, it it can be prolonged but just like anything when you have really low flows in the stream um, you're not going to see a big impact so that's kind of stream flow dependent if you have a really low flow year like 2021 you're not going to see quite as big of an impact for that like you would in a high water year um, in 2019 for example well, kind of along the same lines, another question from Michael, um, just talking about typical range of CFS cubic feet per second in East Canyon Creek. Um, and I will throw the, the gauge in the chat and you can look at years of data for this, but we typically see anywhere from 40, 50 CFS in East Canyon Creek on that Bittner gauge um, in like spring flows and snow melt all the way down to right about now, this time of year, we see our lowest flows that can approach one CFS, two CFS, um, which are really low flows. We are hoping to have at a minimum six CFS to support um, fish populations in the stream. So just to kind of give you, give you a little context um, about the fluctuations there. Yeah, I can show this graph real quick again. It's um, This is actually in CFS. Most of my graphs were in metric, but this one's in CFS. So you can see like an average flow year for that um, I-80 stream gauge is somewhere just under uh, 100. So you're talking maybe like 70, 60. Um, whereas at Jeremy Ranch, you'd see much higher flows, well above 200 in some years, but an average being maybe 150 to 200. I threw that gauge in the chat so people can kind of play around with the different data that's in there. Um, Carrie asked, what is the length monitored for each um, reach? So the control and the treatment reaches, and then what's the distance between those two reaches? Yeah, so the length um, varies a little bit by site, by paired sites, I should say. So each one is, a, um, they're the same for the pair, but there can be slightly different between it. On average, they're about uh, but they're between about 175 to 200 meters, so a fairly long stretch. Um, some of them are shorter. The McLeod Creek ones are shorter just because the beaver habitat itself is so complex that it was too difficult to monitor a hundred plus, or sorry, 200 plus long uh, meter reach. And then what was the last part, Ria? um the distances between oh yeah the distances between so they're um they're over they're they're over as a uh, length apart from one another so for example if the if the um treatment reach is 200 meters the control reach is at least 200 meters away from it it's oftentimes more than that so both the bda and the control reaches i think i think they're about um, 300 to 400 meters from each other. I'd have to measure that out again, but somewhere on that scale. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. Um, another question. Joan asked, um, Joan does Utah Water Watch and was wondering if you used any of that data in your research. I or have not yet, but it could be useful. Um, I believe Water Watch takes some um, some measurements of dissolved nutrients, which could be of interest for sure. And yeah, I think I've done one or two of those water watch surveys just as part of teaching here at USU. And yeah, that could be a valuable resource. Thank yeah. you, good point. I know that um, some other projects have used that data, so it's super useful. And um, also throw Utah Water Watch link in the chat as well. It's a really great way to get involved as a community scientist and volunteer and collect data all over the state. It's a really cool program. Um, let's see, I'm kind of looking through. Abby asked, do you follow a pre-existing program or process for BDAs? So maybe you can kind of speak to BDAs as a whole and um, we didn't invent them um, and kind of how, how they came about a little bit. Maybe you can kind of- yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So yeah, the general kind of um, recipe, if you will, for BDAs was um, pioneered or really developed um, by some researchers, mainly from USU, um, working on a project in Oregon, Bridge Creek Watershed, where they were looking to kind of enhance the perseverance of beaver dams. They kept getting blown out 
So they came up with a strategy to sort of nail the beaver dams into the stream themselves using these wooden fence posts and then try and build their own to create a strength in numbers scenario. So we're following a very similar approach to what they developed over their years of research. Um, yeah, we have tried some other things and kind of you know, taken our own approaches to them, as I was talking about a little bit with the Christmas trees and the erosion mat, which actually the erosion mat idea came to us from Robbie Edgel at um, Utah Department of Wildlife Resources, who's been building some BDAs using that technique. And for, I think, both him and us, it's, it's worked quite well. Great, thank you. Um, Jessica asked, what is the permitting process like? So yeah, we need to, we can't, you can't just build these wherever you need to pursue permits to get these um, installed. So what's that kind of process like and what are those permits like? Yeah, so in the state of Utah, you need to apply for a stream alteration permit. So you apply both the state and the Army Corps of Engineers to get a stream alteration permit, which allows you to make any, uh, which allows you to make a change to the stream bed. So anytime you're doing any construction work or building a bridge or anything like that, you need to apply for one of those. Same thing goes for beaver dam analogs. So we apply for that permit. We essentially estimate how much um, sediment and whatnot we're going to add to the stream. We kind of give maps that show where we're gonna be building them and where nearby infrastructure could be to ensure that we're not um, close to infrastructure potentially damaging. And then we allow, it's allowed to go out for a comment period so people can uh, open, open comment period, just like any kind of federal or state project where people can comment on it and kind of voice their opinion. Um, so that could lead to some other regulations and some other needs, uh, potentially temporary water rights and the things of that like, but in our case, it did not. Um, so yeah, you, you just kind of follow that general plan form. It's pretty similar between different states. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah, we, if you have any other questions about that, we're happy to chat about that. And um, Sageland Collaborative is also a super great resource for permitting. And they are happy to kind of teach people if anybody's a practitioner or is looking to build BDAs, they're just a really great resource for navigating the kind of permitting process and um, what works and what doesn't work for that. Yeah. So they've been a huge help. Um, let's see, Inca, who is one of our preserved neighbors, who's awesome. Beavers are taking down some trees near the Glen Wild Trailhead. So there's some beaver activity on East Canyon Creek right now and kind of whole trees seem to disappear and it appears that the beavers are kind of pulling through maybe a fence. Um, and it, do beavers use that whole tree? Do they drag the entire tree? This kind of speaking to beaver behavior that may be witnessed. Um, maybe you can speak to that a little bit. Like how yeah, so typically, um... They will, they can utilize entire trees, but they don't pull the whole tree. They'll kind of chew it into pieces. They'll section it up, if you will, uh, very similar to how a human might use a chainsaw to buck up a tree, but they'll use their teeth, break it up into all these little pieces. Um, they'll take the smaller limbs and whatnot first, use those as food sources and some modicum of building material. And then they typically use those really big um, pieces to help build their dams. Um, you know, if you ever go to, for example, a, uh, a beaver colony in an aspen grove, you'll notice that they don't use every part of every single tree. That's just kind of the way of the world. Um, most of these trees that are in a natural setting for beaver are adapted to their chews. So they produce um, sprouts or suckering, as it's known. So they kind of regenerate from their root system if the main stem has been taken down. So, um, yeah, I mean, the beaver chew can be a big problem in an agricultural or more of a more of a subdivision home setting where some of these species aren't used to beaver chew and aren't going to re-sprout. But in a wild setting, like in an aspen grove or a willow stand or cottonwood forest, it's not that detrimental because these um, species are adapted to kind of take that disturbance as a positive in their favor, so to speak. Yeah, great. That kind of um, speaks to Inca's follow-up, which is about kind of concern of beavers taking down trees, which um, we are really on that wildland urban interface on the Swanner Preserve, like on one side of the fence is the preserve and the other side is 
housing and I-80 and um, commercial and bike path, all kinds of stuff going on. So we are really kind of aware of that interface and um, a relationship with it. So we've done a lot of tree protection near the eco center. Marshall uh, showed a picture of that dam and pond and lodges are just like right next to the eco center. Um, and so they, the beavers there have taken down a lot of our larger trees, which um, was a surprise at first when they first moved in. But we've also seen a lot of that sprouting that Marshall has spoken to from those cottonwoods and aspens that have been taking down just tons of sprouts being shot up. That being said, um, that it is important to protect some trees in this kind of more urban setting um, or in a residential area. If there are trees that are in your backyard that you don't want to get taken down by beavers, um, that's totally fair. And we have done a lot of fencing, done some painting, a lot of kind of trial and error in protecting trees. And we've got it pretty down now. So if anybody has any questions about that, um, and maybe I'll follow up with you offline, Inka, about that. Um, we can share a lot of resources about favorite fencing, favorite what's worked, what hasn't worked. Um, and we have been able to kind of protect larger trees that we don't want to get taken down by the beavers while leaving plenty for them to um, stay and have plenty of food and material for their lodge and dam. Um, Let's see, any other kind of question? I'm scrolling back. Anybody have any other questions? Let's see, Joe said, is there a nominal range of stream flow reduction to gauge a minimally effective BDA? So are we measuring, maybe maybe this question is kind of like, are we measuring um, stream flow as a success or, or not, or kind of changes in stream flow? Yeah, so I do. The short answer is I have a bunch of data that I didn't present. We collected a bunch of stream flow measurements last year, and we created our own uh, sort of miniature stream gauges, both below and above the two BDA complexes to kind of get at this question. Um, the short answer is there wasn't a lot of change between uh, below and above. I'm still working up that analysis, and I didn't put it in here just for time's sake, but we're looking at changes of like one to two CFS, both in the positive and negative direction, depending on the time of year and the current condition of the stream. So that is sometimes we were losing one CFS, sometimes we were gaining two CFS, sometimes it was flip-flopped between the two. Um, yeah, it's a complex subject. Um, trying to get at a water balance using only stream gauges is, um, would be looked at with some suspicion, I think, in the water resources um, scientific publishing community. But I think it is a really important question. And it's something that people have asked a lot, both in relation to beaver dam analogs and natural beaver dams. And there's a lot of ongoing work that kind of uh, just illustrates that it's really site dependent. It really changes from site to site. And it has a lot uh, to do with kind of that floodplain and then even groundwater geology uh, interaction. Yeah, well, Joe said, yeah, probably an area for future research then. So lots of research uh, to be done and more to learn. Um, someone followed up about kind of beaver tree protection, sand painting. Have you done any toxicology study on the potential harm to beaver health? If they end up consuming any paint. So where we have painted trees with a mixture of sand, it kind of makes sandpaper. So we're not, um, we have not studied beaver, like blood toxicology, if they have ended up chewing these. What we have, what I've discovered is, uh, it's not super effective over a long term. Um, and fencing is much more effective, just a physical barrier. Um, so, you know, in the past, we've kind of mixed sand and paint together, exterior paint, and it makes like a sandpaper covering that is abrasive to chew on, but um, that may hold beavers off for a long time, and it may not. They may look at it and eventually be like, I can't take it anymore. So that's not something that we've looked into, but is a valid question. Um, but the sand painting alone is not something that I would suggest um, as a kind of end all be all for tree protection and would definitely say fencing or physical barriers are much more effective. Um, Scott asked, was there any pre or post macro invertebrate surveying done as well? 
the answer is I wish that I had the capacity to collect that data, but I did not, unfortunately. So no, we don't have a lot of pre and post macro invertebrate data. Um, there has been some research on that that's been published uh, about beaver dams in particular. Um, and kind of the, the main takeaway is that beaver dams are more like pond habitat. Um, so they contain a different assemblage of species than the normal stream species. So what you typically see is if you're looking at something like diversity across a stream, that beaver dams can enhance diversity by allowing more pond or lake adapted species to, to live there while they have a little bit lower um, species diversity in them, like within the pond itself has a little lower species diversity than the stream next to it does. But if you look at it from a landscape scale, they're actually increasing species diversity by uh, capturing or providing habitat for new species that wouldn't have existed there prior. Cool, thank you. All right, one last question from Sierra who has built a lot of BDAs on the preserve and just across the state. Uh, what kind of inspired you to pursue this research? Um, could you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, um, I think I was just generally inspired by uh, Beaver themselves and uh, and actually seeing the the work that they do and the changes to the ecosystem that they cause. I had done um, a lot of work with fish, as you might be able to tell, and kind of stream habitat and that sort of thing. And so I had been exposed to beaver and non-beaver sites in that manner. Um, and so really when I was coming back to grad school, I was really interested in, in studying beaver and kind of this emerging technology in, in restoration, or not technology as much as technique, I guess, in restoration of kind of mimicking beaver and encouraging, uh, actually providing habitat for beaver themselves to take over and uplift the system. So yeah, I think it was just twofold from a, from a personal exposure perspective. I thought beaver were pretty interesting and pretty cool. And then I was really into restoration of so beaver damn analogs and the like where it's a natural fit. Cool. Well, we've loved getting to build all of these BDAs and study them on the preserve and get so much of our community involved. And um, we have all these beaver believers with us tonight who have been part of this project, which is really awesome to see. Um, so like Marshall said, you, we need to maintain these structures. And so even though I am not out there every night, um, chewing and putting mud on these dams, um, even if people may think so. Uh, we will have some volunteer events this fall where we will be kind of rebuilding these dams and adding to them just like beaver would. So you can look for those this September. We'll be getting out all over the preserve and, and you can uh, practice your, your BDA skills. Um, but I just want to thank you, Marshall, so much for um, all the work that you've done and this presentation, taking the time um, to share all this data with us and answer all of these questions so thoughtfully. Um, so thank you. Yeah, thank you all for coming. Thank you for the opportunities. It's been great. And we'll be back again soon. Uh, if you're into it, there's maybe some up and coming uh, research articles that might come out of this. So keep an eye out. I'm sure Swanner will say will share them if and when they become published material. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, everybody, for your great questions, and we really appreciate you tuning in on this Thursday evening. Um, we'll be sending a follow up email with the survey, with our contact information, with a lot of the links that we've talked about tonight. So keep an eye out for that, and don't hesitate to reach out with questions, beaver sightings. <laughs> other cool stuff uh, so thank you we'll see you Thanks. guys next time